Welcome back to another edition of the Edge Podcast. Publisher Brendan Slaughter here for BeaversEdge.com. Joined by Beavers Edge writer Ryan Harlan. We're coming to you guys in advance of Oregon State's Sweet 16 matchup against Notre Dame. The Beavers are headed east, headed to Albany, New York to take on the Fighting Irish. It's going to be a great matchup, and it is the first Sweet 16 matchup that's going to be played on the women's side as Things will get going early on Friday morning, Ryan, 11 a.m. for uh, Oregon State fans here on the West Coast. So we're going to be bringing you guys wall-to-wall coverage, so make sure to stay locked to beaversedge.com. want to welcome on Ryan. Uh, as you guys all know, Ryan was with me down at uh, Gill Coliseum this last weekend covering uh, the round of 64 and the round of 32. Ryan, it's good to see you, my man. Uh, how's uh, spring break treating you? Good to see you as well, spring break. Nice little lull in action before we get – this more basketball on Friday and I know it's gonna be an early tip but I will take that over a later tip <laughs> on the east coast at any point in time having lived there and having grown up there on the east coast before coming out here to Oregon State yeah you know it's it's you know you kind of look at the bracket Ryan and as, as it ended up breaking out you know the bracket for the most part pretty much went chalk I mean you know Obviously, you know, not a whole lot of upsets on Oregon State side of the bracket. You know, you look at what uh, obviously the Beavers able to do in the first round, taking down Eastern Washington, uh, 73-51. And then in the second matchup, took down Nebraska, uh, 61-51. We'll kind of get into those each individual matchups. Uh, And then below the Beavers, uh, obviously Notre Dame took advantage of a 15 seed in Kent State and cruised their first round win. Uh, Then took took down Ole Miss, 71-56. Uh, Then on the opposite side of the same bracket, uh, South Carolina and Indiana are the two teams awaiting. So should Oregon State uh, be able to knock off the Fighting Irish uh, on Friday, that would set up a Sunday matchup between uh, South Carolina and Indiana, depending on who won that matchup. Ryan, it's pretty safe to say that South Carolina is the team to beat in the field. So uh, Oregon State, should they get past the Fighting Irish, are not going to uh, have any easier of a road. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, (laughs) even though it kind of went the way that we expected you know Oregon State hosting taking the first two games at home and you know you and I were there on Friday after they beat Eastern Washington and Scott Ruick had mentioned then that like that game prepping for Eastern Washington was almost more of a stress than like a a fun because he's like this is the game you can't lose when you host you can't lose that first game right and you know Oregon State played a very inspired Eastern Washington team and they were able to put their foot down and ultimately get that win uh, and then faced a much stiffer test uh, against Nebraska and that was a game that again Oregon State only won by 10 Ryan and I say only because that game kind of hung around until like the very and it was kind of a, a weird kind of muck it up game, kind of make it ugly a little bit, which is kind of Oregon State's style. Uh, they obviously play better when they hold their opponent well below their scoring marks and they're able to kind of play that defensive game. But uh, obviously, you know, the Eastern Washington game, I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. We'll talk about it a little bit. But what were your thoughts uh, from that Nebraska game? Is Nebraska, you know, for what it's worth, I, I know that Oregon State was able to win, Ryan, but Nebraska played Iowa really tough this year a couple times and they had some solid wins on the year they were a good team oh yeah nebraska going into this matchup was a solid three-point shooting team and they really couldn't get anything going uh inside either the 10 blocks that'll do it for Mm -hmm. for, um, them and that and their head coach was saying afterwards um they went first before oregon state did and talking to scott ruick and talia and to me at gardner that those blocks and defensively what they were able to do just prevented them from scoring a lot more points right. than they did. And they were before they had made a couple threes late in the game to bring it close within 10, they were they only had made two the entire game mm. <laughs> up until that point. Yeah. So it was very much a tough shooting stretch for Nebraska through most of that through most of four quarters essentially. And yeah. And then for on the opposite end for Oregon State, started out very hot and then faltered a bit in the second quarter. Just both teams couldn't buy a shot. And then they drained three threes in a row to get back back in, which were some really big, important threes to extend out that lead. I think the Beavers just just hit shots when they mattered the most and were able to connect when, when they could. Totally. And I'm curious your take, too, because, you know, it's one of the most unique things about uh, women's basketball, Ryan. You know, obviously uh, you being uh, here with us at Oregon State, obviously kind of know the baseball format. But other than baseball, women's basketball is 
very similar as far as the postseason goes, at least the first couple rounds, right? So, you know, it's it is not something you can take for granted when you can host the first two rounds at your building. And, you know, I, you know, there's obviously many reasons why, but Ryan, I think a big reason why you don't see a whole lot of the quote unquote Cinderella's in women's basketball. I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think a big reason is that because for those Cinderella's to get on their run, they have to go into a South Carolina's home, a Notre Dame's home, home a you know Stanford's home a USC's home and try and beat them on their home floor and then advance compared to like you know men's March Madness where like you know you've got Kentucky and Oakland in you know Dallas right and it's like that's not really a and I actually don't know if that's where they played off the top of my head but you know I'm just throwing it out there uh like you know and that was a cool cool win obviously for Oakland but you know would they have been able to get that win if they had to go into Lexington Kentucky and play Kentucky at home I don't know right so I think that's kind of a very unique thing uh, about women's basketball and obviously you and I were there Friday I don't think they would have necessarily needed the crowd to ultimately get that win you know you could tell real early to your point about the defense in the second game, that's exactly what they did in the first game, right? Scott Ruick, they were trailing after the first quarter, circled the wagons and said, hey, we're, we're going to start playing some defense. And I think, you know, after Eastern Washington shot something like 55% in that first quarter, never shot higher than like 35 the rest of the way. So they really did clamp down. I'm curious for you, Ryan, how big of an impact was that crowd on Sunday uh, against Nebraska? And just play the hypothetical. How do you think this one plays out if they weren't at home? For for the crowd, that definitely played a role. I think yeah. Nebraska players kind of touched on it a little bit. I think Jazz Shelley touched on yeah. it a little bit uh, in the post game presser, which you know they they kind of said that like, hey, we've gone into hostile environments right on the road before that went over Iowa. Uh, that- <laughs> pretty good, pretty good program there in <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and they were, that, that definitely played a role for, right. for sure. And I, I really do think it probably would have been a different story had Nebraska yeah. been playing at home. Uh, probably a similar score for sure, but yeah. definitely, uh, definitely played a big, big factor in that crowd on Sunday mm-hmm. was loud than it was on Friday. I my after, I, cause I like hung around, a little bit after the game finishing writing and sure like my ears were still still <laughs> ringing a bit after after uh after the game and it was like that crowd was yeah that's i think one of the loudest well i thought friday was loud that yeah. was one of the loudest environments i've ever been in in gill and yeah in my, in my time here and that was just really cool to really cool to see that and beaver nation showed out <laughs> That's yeah, you know, play, yeah, they showed out big. Yeah, it's been awesome to see the support uh, from Oregon State fans, you know, getting out and supporting the women's basketball program. Because to your point, like, you know, uh, obviously they hadn't hosted in a handful of years. And uh, I hadn't, you know, been, you know, you, you don't think you forget in like four or five years, but you kind of do a little bit. And I was like, oh, yeah, like th- this, this, this was kind of like what this environment was like, you know, handful of years ago, uh, obviously pre COVID times when Oregon state had, you know, pretty much hosted every single year. So uh, yeah. And we talked a lot about that with Scott Rook afterwards. And, and, you know, that was kind of a cool moment to uh, kind of, you know, see how excited they were to kind of get back to hosting again, because it had been such a, a staple of the program. Like I said, for so long, like when I was in your shoes, Ryan and, and down at Oregon state and that, that was um, obviously where they hung their hat on was being an elite program. And they're right back in that mix. Uh, kind of just some final thoughts uh, from that. I mean, with that, Ryan, you can never take advantage or take for granted how important it was for Oregon State to to host. And I only say that because, like I said, looking at the 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 bracket, you know, imagine if it had you know went the other way, and you know, Oregon State maybe is you know you go back to that Pac-12 tournament game against Colorado, right, where it was pretty much the unsaid thing like hey whoever gets this win is probably going to host and whoever doesn't is probably not and that's pretty much how it played out right Colorado ended up being a five seed they didn't host but particularly uh a team that I was curious to kind of talk about just a little bit slightly was um was Utah because I thought Utah was one of the better teams in the conference this year Uh, again Utah Ryan who 
uh, for what it's worth, gave South Carolina a game this year. You know, you go look back at the non-conference and Alyssa Peely, that team gave the Gamecocks all they could handle in the non-conference. And they lose to Gonzaga, uh, uh, you know, Gonzaga in Gonzaga. And I don't mean to take anything away from uh, Gonzaga, but Utah was like a really good team this year and they didn't get to host. And, you know, I, I just think the the potential for that kind of a thing, um, you know, can obviously happen more. And, you know, uh, I think once again, you can't take for granted that Oregon State was able to take care of business, get to the Sweet 16, because as you and I point out, Ryan, this is only the fifth overall for Ruick and the sixth Sweet 16 ever in school history. It's not like Sweet 16s are growing on trees, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And hosting is really important because you got that home crowd behind you and mm -hmm. it's an environment that you're used to playing in. And the teams that are coming to you have not played in this environment before. So that's that's a big, I think, a big factor to just the familiarity of being being at home is a really totally. big deal for a lot of those programs. And I saw something from the women's team, the social media team posting that they were 18 and two this year at Gill. Pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. So yeah, I think we probably would have seen maybe a different result, maybe an early, maybe they probably win that. We're playing in hypotheticals now, but sure. like maybe they win that first round and then they bounce out of the round of 32. If they don't get that, opportunity to host after right. that win in the Pac-12 tournament over Colorado right. which if you look at kind of way weighing the two a little bit I'm like that double overtime game I think after that Beavers just lost all the momentum and gas that they had because that double overtime that takes that takes a lot out and out it's like the they year. they needed it and they knew that they need yeah. like it, like no disrespect because hey Colorado took care of business they uh, I forget who their first round opponent was but they beat Kansas State in Kansas in Manhattan so credit yeah. to the Buffs man and I I said forever Colorado's a really good team like pretty much every team in the Pac-12 was really good who made it into the, you know, into the round of 64 this year. Uh, I know Arizona came in as like an 11 seed and they got bounced the first round, but even Arizona was good this year to an extent. So Pac-12 was deep this year, Ryan. And and honestly, that's really what it came down to. Uh, but, you know, I've seen, I've also seen it. I've seen Oregon State reach the Sweet 16 when not hosting. Um, so anything's possible and it can always happen, but you just feel so much better playing at home. And you could just tell from, the smiles on the girls' faces, smiles on Scott's face, like they were genuinely stoked and thrilled to be at Gill Coliseum. And, you know, um, it, it was awesome. You know, it was a great weekend. And, you know, obviously we're going to say took care of business. But now the, take a breath and the deck resets, Ryan, because now another really, 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 really good opponent uh, comes to the table in the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and we'll obviously be uh, previewing that at beaversedge.com this week, so make sure to stay locked into it, and, you know, um, I'll say this, Ryan, this is the one time I'm going to complain about it, and then I won't say it again. I think both the fan bases of UConn, who is playing in the Portland Regional, just 10 miles up the road from me here, and Oregon State, who's from Oregon and going to Albany, New York, which is not very far from Storrs, Connecticut, would love to trade places. They're both three seeds, Ryan, so it works very easily. So I I'm just saying that's the one complaint. I know all the reasons as to why and the NC rules on playing teams and yada yada. I don't care. It was the silliest thing in the world that Oregon State is not in Portland uh, with a you know with a chance for beaver nation as you mentioned and i'm sure beaver nation will travel out and support well but brian realistically asking beaver nation to travel three thousand miles when you could have been like hey moda center is right here literally <laughs> right up the road and you know obviously i hope hope all goes well but i'll say this i i think the nca and moda might have uh might have missed out on some revenue here ryan just just a thought oh no i i agree and and when when like thinking about seating before the announcement came out, sure. it's like you, you'd you hope the NCAA does the right thing and puts a team that's literally not that far away from Portland yep. in the Portland regional. And I'm like, well, that's, that's what you get for trying to assume that they're going to do the right thing. But like making that 3000 mile trek, like I've done it before. Yeah. It's a lot. It it's is a lot. And that's something where where like you know I I will expect Beaver Nation to travel well, but like 
probably might be a smaller contingent of fans compared to others that are at uh, Albany because of the travel distance. Yeah, it's so, definitely yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting definitely factor. from yeah, I think it's definitely interesting from the perspective that it's not really Ryan a um, a home game for Notre Dame either. Like, obviously, way easier, sure, for Notre Dame to get there. But I just had to look because I was curious. It's an eleven hour drive from store or from Albany, New York, to uh, Notre Dame. So I'm just, you know, that still means that they would have to fly. I mean, hey, if the Beaver, if Moda was ten hours away, I think that'd be a little tough too. But. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, for the most part, like, you know, I, I guess I don't want to make the whole podcast uh, about that. But specifically, I know I've said a few times, like, just like, where are the brains, man? Like, it's not even like create an unnecessary home court advantage. It's like the NCAA is about profit. Who doesn't want to make money? I guarantee you there is not a team unless like. Gonzaga or Stanford, but even still, they wouldn't sell out as well as Oregon State would if they were in, like, you know, Moda's going to look back and go, man, we we, we could have had a lot of orange and black in the seats. So, you know, just, just saying. It seemed like a missed opportunity, but nevertheless, the Beavers will take it and, and go to work with the blue-collar mentality that they have, Ryan. Uh, before we dive into kind of some of the numbers, what are just your, your kind of initial thoughts on this matchup? Obviously, Two seed versus three seed, you know, of, other than South Carolina, the best of the best in this side of the Albany uh, regional. Just initial thoughts. Do you think this is a game where Oregon State can take advantage and, you know, potentially punch their ticket to the Elite Eight? Is it going to be super tough from what you're, st- you know, seeing and, and looking at? Uh, what are just your initial thoughts? My initial thoughts are, well, the, I saw the line and it's like a three, Notre Dame's like a three and a half point favorite. So it's going to be yes. a tight, a tight one. That's for sure. But also, too, at the same time, I'm like, it's March. Any team has a chance for an upset. Absolutely. And, and as John Rothstein says, <laughs> we sleep in May. Like, that's exactly how, Ain't how that the I truth. feel. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I mean, even, too, like, after leaving Gill, I was like, hey, while I'm, <laughs> basketball may be done at the Gill, it's, we still got more. We still yep. got more to go. And I, I, I think it's always possible. You never say, you never, say never to that but I think it's going to be a little tougher competition than what Oregon state has faced in the first two rounds by, I would say a relatively significant margin, especially that first round matchup against Eastern Washington, definitely a significant step. It, and then for Nebraska, probably be about another, about that kind of as well too. But yeah. if they can play defense, like they've been doing in those first two rounds, they got a shot they definitely have a shot to advance to the lead eight. Yeah. You know, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely interesting, Ryan, because I, I mentioned, I, I mentioned this to you, I believe uh, over the weekend and it's that, you know, uh, for those who have been following the program for a while, I don't know if there's quite a, um, a team um, other than Stanford who has kind of been, the uh you know pebble in the shoe of scott ruick so to speak in big moments more than notre dame only because you know the 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 games have been a few years back now but all in the scott ruick era ryan beavers are 0 and 4 all time against notre dame right those losses are by 1 5 10 and 12 points and you know i remember the 1 point loss specifically well because i believe that game was uh, here at Gill Coliseum, you know, a handful of years ago. And that game stands out extremely well. And I think that this is kind of a game where Scott Ruick as a coach probably really wants this more than like, you know, in, in a different way than like his players, because he's like, oh, those, those, those Irish again, kind of a thing. Right. And, you know, I think he's going, you know, you know, this about Scott, Scott's maybe one of the best competitors as a coach that I know. He is extremely competitive. He is always looking for an edge and how to, you know, consistently make his teams, you know, play above the level that they're at. And I think that's kind of the 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 greatness of Scott Ruick is being able to get the most out of his girls. And then even more than that, being able to turn it up even another degree. So with that, you mentioned obviously Notre Dame comes in as a three and a half point favorite. Uh, they're twenty eight and six on the year. Beavers twenty six and seven. Uh, Notre Dame finished uh, 
third in the ACC behind Virginia Tech and NC State, or excuse me, behind Virginia Tech, they were tied uh, with NC State and Syracuse at 13 and five. So obviously a good year for the Fighting Irish, but let's talk a little bit about the differences in the teams, Ryan. Uh, Obviously the thing that jumps out the most to me is just how different they are depth wise. Uh, Notre Dame does not nearly go as deep as Oregon State does. They're kind of reliant on their starting six, starting seven. And that kind of all starts with Hannah Hildego, who's one of the better players and all of women's basketball, uh, averaging 22 points, six rebounds, five, five and a half assists a game. And then ho-hum on top of that, Ryan, uh, five steals a game as well. So she is, you know, a, a really good basketball player and she's kind of the engine that makes the Irish go. I, I think very much like, you know, the case is whenever Scott Rook's teams go up against any good team, you look at whose style is going to win out. And Notre Dame averages uh, almost 80 points per game. They're 27 and four when they score at least 59. And, you know, that's the thing where Oregon State, that's the sweet spot, right? 59.4 points is what they allow. So starting on that side of the ball, Ryan, you know, let's start with defense for Oregon State. The challenge of slowing down Hannah Hildego, that's going to be tough. And, you know, you've also got Sonia Citrone, who's averaging 17 points, Maddie Westfeld, uh, 14 points. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, obviously, Kylie Watson as well being thrust into a bigger role. They've got some talent. They've got a lot of talent, like any Notre Dame team is that you would expect. And from that perspective, uh, we'll talk about Oregon State's offense against Notre Dame's defense in a minute, but... That defense is going to have their hands full, Ryan, and I think that, you know, Donovan Hunter is going to have to play, you know, big defensive minutes on Hannah. I think Talia is going to have to play some big defense, um, you know, maybe show multiple multiple girls as far as, you know, different looks. But, yeah, ultimately, I think that offense, that's going to be the challenge is can they slow down Notre Dame's offense, kind of muck it up like they did against Nebraska. Yeah, that's going to be the biggest point of emphasis I think I'm going to keep an eye on and you got you got players that can score from anywhere on the court. And speaking of Sonia Citron, she's one of a few Notre Dame legends that have gone through that program who have twenty multiple twenty five plus points per game. In addition to her, Skylar Diggins, Ruth Riley, Jackie Young, Kayla McBride, Jewel Lloyd, and Enrique Gumbawale. Pretty good names. So pretty good names <laughs> uh, in company with her on that list and. That's definitely going to be a lot of ask on Donovan Hunter, especially to as a freshman in a yeah. big, big game like that. And definitely, like you said, Tutalia is going to have to play big defensive minutes as well. And it's really just everybody being as sound as possible and not having a slow start right out the gate in the first quarter. And I think that first round matchup against Eastern Washington. Sure, they started out slow. The Beavers started out a bit slow, but once they figured it out, they they can match up well just as as much as anybody. And then it was quite the opposite against Nebraska, where they started out fast but had a lull in there in in the second to about start of third quarter, and then they mm-hmm. hit those three threes and they're able to regain some momentum on their side. And I it. And really the way that Ruick kind of described both of those games was kind of like, that's just basketball. You're going to have some really good moments. And then you're going to have some ones that are kind of head scratching a little bit and <laughs> you just got to work through them. And I think Talia was saying that like, yeah, we could have let those, those things kind of affect us negatively, but we didn't, we just kept going through it and we were able to knock down shots and secure, secure win. So right. I think that's what, like you said, they're going to have to just power through and win ugly. Right. And, and I'm also, it's been, their, it's been their brand all, it's been their brand all season. It's kind right. of been all season. Right. And I think kind of with, with this team and, you know, the way that, you know, obviously you go back and look at where they were last year, right? Like this is natural growth, right? And this is even, in my opinion, you're playing with house money compared to where this team was a year ago to where they are now. Like, you know, maybe next year they win games and they're going away with a more veteran laden team. And they're not, you know, but for right now, they figured out the formula, like you said, that helps this team win games. And if there is an advantage, Ryan, I'll say this, looking at, looking at Notre Dame, you know, you know, whether or not Maddie Westbeld and Kylie Watson can match up with Reagan Beers, I think is going to be 
flipping over to Oregon State side is going to be Oregon State's ultimate offensive X factor because you look at, you know, they've only got, you know, two or three forwards. I mentioned Westbelt and Watson, and they've also got Marshall, who's played in a handful of games, but that's only three forwards that have played in, you know, at least 25 more games. If Oregon State could feed beers, try to get those players in foul trouble, I think that's a path to, you know, that could be successful. But then again, on the opposite side, Ryan, I could see Notre Dame being like, anybody but beers and being like okay beers gets the ball in the post we're gonna have you know uh watson or westbell garter straight up but then we're gonna have hildego or citrone come around from the front and try to swipe at the ball double team and that's where the onus i think is going to be on ryan can reagan beers pass out of the double team and can she find her open shooters and then with that can those shooters hit shots right so i think back to like dummy caprova in that first game right that was kind of what Eastern Washington did early. They frustrated beers. They threw a lot of girls at her and they're like, here's your wide open threes in the corner. And first quarter, Oregon state wasn't hitting them. Right. So I think, and hence why Eastern Wa- and they turned the ball over and you know, other things. And that's why Eastern Washington had a lead. But I think if Notre Dame is going to show more pressure on beers, because I think if you look at it right now, beers against West Belder Watson, I, I would take beers and I, and I would like that one-on-one matchup. But if they decide to double her, bring more guards at her and swing the ball around, Ryan, you mentioned uh, earlier, we were talking about the Nebraska game. What would happen if, you know, Oregon state wasn't able to get hot from three. This is where if Notre Dame is able to effectively neutralize beers, which They could, you know, they're a good enough team. They're well coached. They have great athletes. If the Beavers don't hit their outside shots, you know, deep twos, whatever it is, mid range, that's where I think this one could go the other way because Notre Dame likes to get out. They like to run. They can score the ball, score the ball quickly. And as you know, Ryan, Oregon State's a team that's not built to necessarily play from behind. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And then two, Watson is injured. So that's going to be stress on the two other forwards for Notre Dame. And yes, that's and right. I, I like I like beers in that in that matchup. But at the same time, as you also mentioned, they could they could all the, the game plan for Nebraska was to stop beers first and bring out and give the ball to anybody else and say, hey, beat us with Talia, beat us with Tamia Gardner. Um that was their plan. And that's why beers ended up getting into foul trouble there. And, and I, I think this team is capable of, because not only a testament to their depth of winning in different ways, but if they get that kind of look, they've seen it before of like, Oh, okay. They're doubling beers down the post, kick it out to Talia or to me a gardener in the corner sure. and knock down three um that's definitely definitely i think where if they are able to kind of recognize that early and get out to that early lead then they can control the tempo of this game but if they don't right it's going to be really hard for them to play this team it's going to be really hard for this team to play catch up knowing the style that scott likes to run uh, especially offensively a lot of those offensive sets that he he runs so that's definitely going to be, I think, a big, big thing to to watch there. But I, but I still like that matchup though for for beers against the Fords for Notre Dame because right, most of the time I've seen beers in those double teams and she finds a way to get a shot up and right, it's gonna be it's gonna be a very interesting I think kind of matchup to look at going forward because if she's in foul trouble, that's going to be part a of it. really really big big thing to keep in mind oh yeah they're going down the stretch there in the fourth quarter and it's a close game because i was sitting there during during the nebraska game and it was starting to get a little too close right probably for a lot of fans in in the arena there where (laughs) it's like you're getting really close and and they're like wondering i'm like okay scott are you gonna bring back in reagan like i know she has four fouls but like right time is ticking time is ticking uh but but he he didn't, and Beers sat out the rest of the fourth quarter. But he kind of talked about it post game and was like, "Look, those games that we didn't play with Reagan on the court, right? When she was injured, injured. yeah, those were impo- big and those were important in the grand scheme of things. Very true. That it was very much important for for that game to play without Reagan on the floor." And this, I think this team is more than capable of doing that. Should that, should that happen? Uh, right. Notre Dame. 
Right. And, and to your point, right, I, I had got her uh, mixed up with another girl. But to Ryan's point, yes, Kylie Watson did get injured in the ACC yeah. championship game. So that's another four they won't have. So, again, that's really down to then Westfeld and Marshall. And maybe they bring in uh, Mech- Becky Obima, perhaps, if they, if they you know. But two forwards, Ryan, again, if Oregon State can play their game, I, you know, that, that, that's a, uh, an opening you see in this Notre Dame team. And again, more than anything, I think it really is going to be everything you just mentioned. Um, obviously whose style wins out who, you know, if Oregon state's able to get their front court involved, if Notre Dame's able to get their guards involved, because, you know, as we mentioned, Notre Dame rides with those, that guard play, you know, almost averaging 40 points between uh, Hildego and Citrone. And you obviously threw in those, those amazing sat- stats and, and the company that Sonia keeps, which, is you know some some amazing women's basketball guards the last decade or so so i really do think it's going to be a very daunting task for the beavers ryan but at the same token you mentioned it anything can happen in march and this is this would not be a um a anything new for scott ruick's team i mean i i think of a couple times where uh once in the elite eight and then once in the sweet 16 where they played a baylor team in the last you know eight years uh Kim Mulkey coach Baylor team for what it's worth. And, um, you know, both times Oregon state was not heavy, but it was Baylor's probably going to win this game. Baylor's probably going to win this game. And Oregon state both times, you know, was able to get, get it done. And one time went to the final four after that win. the other went to the elite eight. So Scott Rook is no stranger to win in these games and win in these games in, uh, you know, hostile environments, so to speak, you know, away from, you know, obviously Corvallis and Oregon. So I think, you know, the matchup, the way this game does shake out, you know, uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the styles conflict and all that once we actually see it uh, on Friday morning. Again, 11 a.m. ESPN uh, is the uh, tip off time there uh, at the MVP arena in Albany, New York. But TJ or uh, Ryan at the moment, I was telling TJ this over the weekend. I actually like Oregon State's chances uh, in this game. And and if I were to say picking right now, it, it, even though they are three and a half point underdogs, I I think I could confidently pick the Beavs in this. You know, we'll we'll get to excuse me, what could be next? Next, you know, obviously South Carolina is a a Goliath just waiting around the corner. So it's like, oh, even if you win, you get to go deal with them. <laughs> But for the most part, like, I, I really do think that Oregon State matches up stylistically well in this game. And if they can play their game, I really would not surprise me to see them pull this one out. And, you know, hey, Ryan, maybe they get a little revenge for the football team, eh? <laughs> football and soccer. <laughs> right. And soccer, right. yeah. Yeah, it was like. So I, you know, I give them a little jab I, back, when I, right? <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I posted the matchup on – because I was waiting for it, and then when I saw it was Notre Dame, yeah, and everyone's like, "We're playing Notre Dame for the for the third time in a row." Yeah, and like, like hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that this yeah. is the one that can can uh, get revenge for both of those two, those two uh, losses there. Which I will say though, for football, it's like, yeah, even though that was a loss in the Sun Bowl, <laughs> still lead the series all time. That's so, true. Very true. I'm like, I I, I ran into a couple of. Uh, made some friends with a couple student journalists down there for Notre Dame. And I was yeah. like, Hey, like I kind of gave him the nudge, like, Hey, congrats on your first win against Oregon state. <laughs> oh, that was rich, man. That was rich. Yeah. Yeah. But, I was like, yeah, that's like, awesome. I was like, look, I'm more than willing to be friendly, but like I'll throw in a playful jab here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But no, yeah, it's um, it, again, like you said, very coincidental that the Beavers and Irish have suddenly, you know, become such a, such a common opponents and across many different sports uh, this calendar year. But again, like I said, Beaver fans will not have to wait long, Ryan, for this matchup. Uh, you know, we're recording this podcast here on a Wednesday afternoon, and uh, that's, you know, that's less than 48 hours, less than 36, I think, if I'm doing my math correctly. So it's, um, you know, it's it's going to happen real quick. Obviously, the first game, as we mentioned, of the Sweet 16. Uh, I actually think, and last point on this, that is kind of an advantage to the Beavers, Ryan, as far as rest goes, because Oregon State was done playing at, uh, if I'm three, four o'clock Sunday, 
Notre Dame played Monday. So, and then both teams turn around and play Friday. So the Beavers do have, you know, an extra day's rest and that obviously will probably help with the travel. But, you know, that's why I was surprised to see this game on Friday because Notre Dame played Monday. I thought for sure this would be a Saturday game, but nevertheless, folks, uh, tell your boss you're going to need some time off at 11 a.m., Friday morning. Uh, say you got, you know, get, get some get some beeves on the stream. Maybe take your lunch break with the beeves because it's going to be an important game uh, Friday morning, obviously 11 a.m. for us here on the West Coast uh, coming from MVP Arena. Make sure to stay locked to myself and uh, Ryan Harlan. We obviously won't be out there in Albany, New York, not taking the trek. Uh, unfortunately, again, we were Kind of hoping it'd be uh, up the road here at uh, Portland. But nevertheless, uh, we're going to be uh, supporting the Beavs all the way through. So make sure to stay locked into BeaversEdge.com. Beyond this podcast, we're going to have more preview content, uh, obviously leading up to the matchup and uh, preview pieces. And then uh, Ryan and I will obviously be uh, keeping you guys busy with the game thread at BeaversEdge.com for the Beavers Edge subscribers. So definitely make sure to check that out. And if you want to get a refresh of last weekend, make sure to read uh, Ryan and I's stories from over the weekend. Uh, we had a whole bunch of takeaways from those two games. So check that out over at beaversedge.com. Ryan, want to give you a big uh, shout out for joining me on this edition of the podcast, man. Thanks for spending part of your spring break with me, my man. And no uh, looking forward to uh, talking <laughs> ball with you uh, as we get ready for this game on Friday, man. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, very good one. Very exciting. And definitely one where where I'll be, be paying attention to. That's for sure. I was like, I've gotten to see now – both men's basketball and women's basketball make a run in the tournament so that's yeah. that's always fun this time yeah. around i got to be part of the women's there for the yeah. first two rounds so yeah because yeah that elite eight run was covid which i wasn't right. here for so but still nonetheless gonna be a fun matchup <laughs> yeah no it's exciting and uh we're excited to bring you guys coverage again big shout out to ryan for jumping on this edition of the edge podcast with me uh we'll be back we'll probably talk uh sometime next week uh if oregon state beats notre dame we might come to you guys with an emergency podcast uh preview in the south carolina game uh if not we'll definitely be doing a season recap podcast next week kind of talking about things and shifting into baseball season as ryan we went an entire podcast didn't even talk about the number two oregon state baseball team which Calm down, Diamond Boys. We, we're going to give you guys your love for sure. Uh, except, you know, right now it's postseason. We want to make sure we give the ladies their due because they've been putting in work. And uh, obviously a huge matchup this weekend. But uh, obviously we're getting into the uh, full swing of things. Make sure to stay locked into BeaversEdge.com. Beyond this week is... Ryan and I and TJ have already been at spring football practices. That's going to be starting up again this next week. Uh, I believe April 4th is when they come back and start it up again. So that's going to be time to stay locked into Beaver's Edge as well as baseball, as we mentioned, uh, making a strong push for Omaha as we're looking here in uh, late March. So an exciting time to be around Oregon State Athletics and BeaversEdge.com is the place to be. So again, big shout out to Ryan Harlan for jumping on this edition. Uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for watching slash listening on this edition of the Edge Podcast.